Hello and welcome to Bronchiolitis. My name is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. Let's go ahead and get started. Let's talk about bronchiolitis. Bronchiolitis typically is caused by a virus and the most common one is RSV. What happens when a patient gets a bronchiolitis infection is that we're going to have normal cells in the lower respiratory tract become disrupted by the virus, which then allows the cells to cluster together. When they cluster together, they lose their normal function. The bronchioles then become swollen and mucus forms. Remember again, the bronchioles are those small little airways that branch off and go to the alveoli. So we're way out there where all the gas exchange is occurring. Because of the mucus formation and the swelling, we start to get inflammatory obstruction of those small airways. This is a common type of infection in young children, usually less than two years old, but it can occur in adults. Oftentimes that's because the adult has some other underlying problem like chronic bronchitis, viral infection, or inhalation of toxic gases, and then we have a bronchiolitis on top of that. So that gas caused irritation of the airways, which then allowed them to become infected, and now we have bronchiolitis. So here's what's happening with those cells. You see the virus there, the RSV is attaching to that cell, to the cell membrane, and it's causing changes to occur on the cell, which then allows the cell to start bunching together and causing that abnormal function in those small airways. So here's that small airway way out there, that little bronchiole that's out there by the alveoli. So again, this is going to be really important because that means we're not going to get oxygen down to the alveoli. We're not going to be able to get rid of our CO2 from those alveoli as well because we have this um, blockage that's occurring down here. The other problem that occurs too is with mucus formation way out there, it's very difficult to get that mucus to move along. If you have bronchitis, which then is an inflammation of those larger bronchi. It's a little bit easier to move some of those secretions along and get them out of the patient's lung. But with these tiny little airways, it's a lot more difficult to get those secretions to move, open those alveoli back up again. Uh, here's a child that has uh, bronchiolitis and is receiving an aerosol treatment to try to open up those airways with some bronchodilators. So symptom-wise, we'd anticipate that the patient's going to have an upper respiratory infection that's going to precede the bronchiolitis. So the patient's going to have a runny nose, fever. Symptoms of an upper respiratory infection, some people might just describe this as having a cold, followed by lower respiratory symptoms such as wheezing, crackles, respiratory distress, cough, etc. And then swelling of the airways is going to result in the patient having air trapping and atelectasis. So here we're seeing some of the signs that often come with bronchiolitis, some of the swelling that we see of those larger airways because of air trapping that's occurring in a lung. Diagnostically, we can look at our CBC. We're looking for an elevated white blood cell count. We're assessing the BMP to try to assess fluid and electrolytes. Uh, these especially small children are going to have difficulty with being able to take enough fluid and enough nutrition while they are having difficulty breathing. It may be necessary to get an arterial blood gas so that we can take a look at oxygenation and make sure that we have adequate CO2 removal as well. Typically that would be done if we're seeing other symptoms that the patient maybe isn't oxygenating. So if we have a pulse ox that's low or maybe we're seeing some other symptoms like cyanosis, we may do a blood gas to try to determine just how bad the problem is. And a chest x-ray, that would also help to rule out pneumonia. It doesn't necessarily help a lot here, but would also help to rule out the possibility of pneumonia. So then treatment-wise, Another picture there of a child who is receiving bronchodilators, yeah, and that's going to be one of our main treatments. Open up those small airways so that we can try to get some of those secretions to move, keeping in mind that the small airways are going to be restricted to some extent because of bronchoconstriction. 
Humidified air and oxygen may be helpful too. Get some humidification down there, help loosen up the secretions. Oxygen may be helpful if we're having difficulty with oxygenation. And some nasal bulb suction may be necessary, especially if there is secretions that are blocking the upper airway from that upper airway or that upper respiratory infection, such as a cold kind of a thing. Let's get rid of some of those secretions. Hydration, very important because we want to move those secretions along and the child may not be taking enough fluid to be able to maintain their hydration. Corticosteroids may be helpful to decrease some of that inflammation in those bronchioles so that they'll open back up again. Keep in mind that the bronchodilators are the things that are going to work now. The corticosteroids are the things that are going to work later. So later today, tomorrow, the corticosteroids are going to be helpful in opening up those airways. But for right now, the bronchodilators are the things that are going to open it up so that that child will get enough oxygen. It may also be a precursor to future asthma. So that's one thing we would want to let the parents know is to uh, be aware of and watching for any signs that the patient may be having difficulty breathing later in life because this could be a precursor for future asthma. Why? We don't really know. Um, whether it's the irritation that occurs during the infection that predisposes the airways to becoming hyperactive, or maybe it's patients who are at risk for asthma who are more at risk for bronchiolitis. Um, but one way or the other, there is a connection between the two. Thank you for joining me today for Bronchiolitis. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, 